All right. Greetings from Pennsylvania. Hello, Scott. Hello, 5 Carsons 5 Living Grace Fully. Hello from Florida. There's Gabby Abbey, the ever faithful Gabby Abbey. Home's home. Great to see you. I'm just going to turn the brightness up here a little bit. There we go. Okay. We're back. Grace, Faith, Hope, Love 3. Welcome, Seth. Great to see you, Seth. Thank you for taking such good care of my family in Florida. Hello, Sharon. Welcome. Hello, those cooks. Jen. Hi. Hello, Hannah. You're in Florida. You can make it. By the way, Hannah, I have a really, really good idea. So I need you to text me because I've got it. Johnny, I've got a really good idea that has to do with DA with DA and it involves, it involves the two of you. So send me a text. Hello, Connie. Hello, Smitten Kitten 64. Oh, I like that. Smitten Kitten. Hello, Shirley. Hello, Cookie. Welcome also to YouTube. We are not live right now on YouTube, but we will upload um, either later tonight or tomorrow morning. Uh, it's 7.30 at night Eastern time, so 5.30 in the evening, my time. And uh, greetings from Pennsylvania. I've got a bunch to tell you. I, I've got a bunch to tell you. I'm just waiting for people to get signed on here. Hello, Gay. Hello, Martha. Hello, Brad, Sherry, Curly, Shirley Cook, Rambler Cat. Hey, Rambler Cat says that they're loving... You've got a camera in front of your face, so I can't tell if you're a male or a female Rambler Cat, but they say they're loving DA with DA. I'm loving DA with DA. Oh. Man, I am, I got nothing to do tonight. So t this could get really long. No, it won't get too long. Oh, hello, Jay Manning Walsh from Southwest Michigan. Hello, Constance Lynn Terry, 100153. Hello, Elwell Spicer, Katterski, Kevin Worth 14, DL Rosen. Hello, everyone. Hey, Puerto Puerto, Puerto. I think I'm saying that wrong. Oh, you used to live in Philly. Somebody's asking where I'm at. The answer is, I have no idea. <laughs> but I'll tell you about that in just a second. I'll tell you where I'm at. Hello, Jamie814, Alex4Jesus9. All right. Good evening, everyone. So glad you are here. Welcome to day 29 of DA with DA. Those are wonderful mountains here. Kochi Stronghold, you would love it. Rambler Cat. Let me know if you're a man or a woman. I can't tell from your photo. We've got nothing to do tonight either, says Paul Getchell. <laughs> well, hey, let's hang out all night together. Oh, I just realized I forgot some water. Well, I might have to get up at some point and get some water because my voice is already a little dry. Wow. Okay, so much to tell you. First of all, welcome everyone. So glad you're here. This is day 29 of DA with DA. I will be in Pennsylvania today and for the next three days going back home to Colorado. My wife flew in to Colorado. I flew out and I didn't get to see her. I'm devastated. I was supposed to be in Pennsylvania, as I think you know, last week, but the big storm uh, caused my flight to be delayed a week. And so I'm here now. And so we're like ships in the night or planes in the air. Um, and I can't wait to see her. By the time I actually see her, because she was with Jable on spring break in Florida, it will have been like 13 days without my wife. And I don't like to spend even, I don't like to spend even one afternoon apart from my wife. So I'm going through a little, uh, I'm going through Violetta withdrawal. Um, so anyway, landed in Pennsylvania. I've just got some quick stories to tell you. I hope you're in the mood for some stories. Okay, first story is got to the airport. Everything was fine. Um, no problems there. Got on the plane was the last one on the plane because I had to make a quick Instagram post about the fact that it was going to be delayed because I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to do DA with DA early this morning, but it just, it just, I was too crammed for time. I would have had to do it like literally at 5.30 in the morning. And I thought, no, I'll just do it more relaxed in the evening. So anyway, I get on the plane and they say, okay, it's a, th it was a nonstop flight from Denver to Philadelphia. And they say, Okay, it's going to be a three hour and eight minute flight. And I was like, oh, 
That's a little longer than I would have thought, but no, that, I guess that makes sense. You sometimes think, I, I sometimes, when I think of Denver, I think of it a little more east than it is. It's actually pretty far west and south, actually. So three hours and eight minutes, and I was like, oh, I'll read the chapter through a couple times. Then I'll probably, I've got my little pillow that I travel with. I go everywhere with my pillow. Some point, ask me to tell you my pillow stories. I have very specific ways that I sleep with my pillows, and I'd love to hear some of you might have similar um, idiosyncratic tendencies when it comes to pillows. Anyway, I travel with one of my own pillows, and I was thinking, I'll read the chapter through a couple times. I'll probably put my head down on the little tray table, take a little nap. Okay, but here's what actually happened. Uh, I didn't eat any breakfast because it was kind of early. I tend to eat a little later after I work out. And so I was like, no, I'll be fine. I'll be fine. I'll eat this afternoon. It's good. to. In fact, today we're talking about fasting. So I was like doing quite a long fast. I didn't eat since yesterday about lunchtime, actually. And uh, so I kid you not, I read the chapter through. I'm like, by the way, our chapter today is chapter 28, Levi Matthew. And we'll be there in a few minutes. I got some stories to tell. Um. Oh, man. I read the chapter through. I'm like, that was incredible. In fact, the first time I read it through, I was so disappointed. I was, I wanted the chapter to be two or three times longer than it was. Anybody else, anybody else out there have that experience? I was like, this chapter is incredible. And we're going, we're going to go deep in just a few minutes. But first, some stories and then a prayer. Uh, so I read it through the first time. I'm like, wow. You know how sometimes you're reading and you're like, oh, is this almost done? But man, that was not my experience today. I read it and I was like, I wish that was 10 pages longer. So I went back, I read it through again. And I, I typically don't mark. I don't do any marking when I go through the first time. Where's my red pen? I left it in my bag. So then I went through the second time marked. Anyway, let me cut this story short. I read the chapter through. I, I lost count. It was either five or six times. And I'm just going, at every read, I'm like deeper and then deeper. The stewardess comes by. Do you want some coffee? Do you want some? No, 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 no. I'm just like, I have meat to eat that you know not of, right? I got food that you don't know about. And uh, I got my pens flying and my Bible's there. And, and uh, <laughs> I'm just in the zone. And so literally every time I go through this chapter, I go a little deeper, a little deeper. And let me just show you what it ends up looking like. I mean, because typically in the mornings, I only have about an hour maybe to get ready. And here I had three hours. Look at this. Look at this. This is what it looks like when you have three hours. Bang. Oh, I just showed you my word. I hope you didn't see that. Okay, and then look at this. Next page. I mean, look at that. That's what it looks like when you have three hours to keep reading a chapter that you wish was another 10 pages longer. Look at that. That's what it looks like. Every pass. Whoa, look at this one. Look at that. I can't wait to share some of this with you. If you're looking at this thinking, oh, this is gonna be a long lesson, you'd be right, you would be right. So I kid you not, I'm thinking, I don't know, maybe I've been on the plane an hour and a half, and you know the plane starts to go, and you can tell you're descending, and the pilot's like, okay, we're beginning our descent. I was like, beginning our descent? Three hours, gone, just, just, just vaporized. It was just me and Jesus and the Holy Spirit. I could not tell you what the persons that were around me on that plane looked like. I was so in the zone. Typically, I'm very talkative and conversational and chatting, and people probably get tired of hearing my voice, but on the plane, right? Because I'm always wanting to talk to them, and they're trying to listen to their iPad or watch a movie or go to sleep. And I'm like, so what's it like in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, or whatever? But not, not this trip. I was just, wham, laser focus. And the plane goes, is it, we're beginning our descent into Philadelphia. I was like, descent? Wait, 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 wait. We just got started. Our flight's only halfway done. <laughs> I kid you not. I mean, whoa. Okay, so then we land. Okay, that's story number one. Story number two. We land and I get on the, the rental car shuttle bus and uh, actually I had to get on an Avis bus to go to the dollar rental car. And I've never had, and by the way, the guy was a really nice guy. He and I were the only ones on the bus. So I was chatting him up about Philadelphia and 
He was a Philadelphia native, born and raised, lived his whole life in Philadelphia. We had a great conversation. And then when I got off the bus, he's like, hey, man, hey, man. He said, thank you for that, that great chat. I enjoyed you. You know, we just, it was good. We had this really good rapport. And I was like, man, kind of like my flight. I wish I would have had another round with this guy because we were really, we were just clicking. Anyway, so he drops me off, even though he was the Avis driver, he let me on the bus because I couldn't find the dollar bus. Well, I later find out, found out why there was no dollar bus. I go in, has this ever happened to anyone? Has this ever happened to anyone? I go into the dollar rental car agency where I have a reservation. I have a reservation. I go in, two lovely people. In fact, I was the only person that went in and there was a guy on the right and a girl on the left. And I walked up and I was like, who should I go to? And uh, they were both were like, oh, we don't care. I said, well, I'm going to go to the, I went to the pretty girl. I said, I'm going to go to the pretty girl. And they laughed. It was cute. And uh, th they didn't have a car. <laughs> I kid you not. So I give her my driver's license. I give her my <laughs> um, well, dri driver's license and credit card. She's like, tick, 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 tick. And then she's like, I'm sorry, we're out of cars. I'm like, you're, you're out of cars? <laughs> She's like, yeah, this happens sometimes. But she said budget might have a car or somebody else might have a car. You just need to walk down this row here and see if anybody else has a car. I was like, oh, all right. Well, you guys have a great day. <laughs> I'm not exaggerating. She's like, yeah, no, no, no car. Sorry, we ran out. We didn't, you know, book it just right. I was like, Okay, somebody says Seinfeld. Yeah, it felt very Seinfeldian. So anyway, I go to budget, met Beverly, and man, she and I were clicking. She was having a baby. She's gonna name the baby um, Kyrie because Kyrie Irving's her favorite basketball player. She asked me about my son. It's her fourth child. Bam, 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 back and forth. She was gonna get this African food that her coworker wanted to get her, but it's too spicy. I mean, we were clicking, and they had a car for me. So anyway. I get, I finally get in the car, Beverly hooks me up and um, I start driving and uh, it's supposed to be an hour and a half to where I am right now. I do not know where I am. All I know is I put the address, D, I'm staying in D Casper's, in fact, I'm in his room right now. He'll be with us tomorrow. Uh, I just clicked on the pin. It said an hour and a half, an hour and a half. Okay. I start driving <laughs> and I'm listening to a super interesting podcast. Long story short, I guess I missed exit number one. I missed exit number two. I missed exit number three. And finally, I've been driving for a little while and I, I slide over because I got the podcast thing on my, I'm not watching my podcast, but it just comes up a little Spotify thing. And it tells me what podcast I'm looking. I think, oh, because I'm, I'm accustomed to getting little notifications, right? <laughs> but no notifications are coming up. So I swipe over and look at it. I'm an hour and 20 minutes from where I'm supposed to be. I've already been driving for an hour and a half. I'm an hour and 20 minutes away. I guess I just kept driving. And uh, so I ended up, it was actually great. I ended up in the Poconos Mountains and it ended up taking me three hours to get here. And it was beautiful. I mean, I've spent some time in Pennsylvania before, but I'm like, the sun was setting like from about, what time is it now? Probably from about five o'clock. Yeah, because I arrived here. Yeah, about five o'clock for that hour and a half, that golden hour. You guys, you, you better appreciate this. I drove by so many great photographs. I mean, photograph, I mean that beautiful evening light and there were old homes and cemeteries and old farms and barns and streams and shadows and that golden hour light that just kept getting better and better. And I was literally like, cause I'm a, I'm a very keen photographer. I'm just like, whoa, man, I wish I could go back. Oh, I, that would have been such a great photo. And I kept thinking, no, I've got to get back for DA with DA. I kid you not. And I just kept driving and it was so, it was awesome, relaxing and beautiful and glorious. And finally the podcast finished. And then I just listened to some great music. I was just like rejoicing in the goodness of God. Beautiful light, beautiful rural, sort of classic Eastern rural landscapes, as I said, with beautiful cemeteries. And, and I was actually thinking as this golden light was coming across several of these beautiful cemeteries, I was thinking, man, 
That's going to be a place to be on resurrection morning. There's some saints in that cemetery. I can just tell. And the beautiful barns and the beautiful old like um, uh, stone walls and stone homes. And I actually did pull over and take just one photograph. It took me like two minutes. There was a perfect little spot to pull over. Er, pulled over. And I'll put that on my Instagram. You can see it. Anyway, wow. It, oh, I mentioned, I forgot one of my stories. Oh, before I took my three-hour journey that was only supposed to be an hour and a half, I just put into the little navigation thing, Whole Foods, because I just wanted to go to a Whole Foods. I hadn't eaten, right? It was like probably 4.30 Eastern, so 2.30 my time, and I hadn't eaten anything yet. So I was like, oh, I'll go to Whole Foods. Big mistake, big mistake. And the mistake was, and you've probably done this too, I went to Whole Foods starving hungry. Right? Like, I'm so hungry. That's a really bad idea. If you value your money, <laughs> it's a really bad idea to go to Whole Foods when you're starving hungry and you haven't eaten since, like, lunch the day before. You, know, you haven't had a meal since lunch the day before. Anyway, went into Whole Foods. I was like, oh, that looks good. Ooh, yeah, two of those. I'll have me some of that. And But you know it's going to be heavy when you got that little, you know, basket on your arm because I just need a couple things just to tide me over until breakfast tomorrow. And uh, all of a sudden, like, it's cutting off the blood in my arm because <laughs> I got so much food in this thing. Oh, but it was so great. I'm eating these, like, amazing, like, super healthy chocolate-covered, cocoa-covered, cacao-covered almonds with cold raspberries and drinking this maca drink. What else did I get? These really beautiful big oranges. You don't care about what food I ate. But I'm just, like, eating, driving, golden light, beautiful rural scenes, great podcast, great music. And I'm just thinking about this chapter. I mean, this chapter, I read it through like six times. Anyway, I've had the most incredible day today. I am on fire, in case you couldn't tell. Um, welcome to DA with DA. That was 20 minutes of stories. Actually, I signed on a couple minutes late. It's like 18 minutes of stories. Here I am, somewhere in rural Pennsylvania. Oh, that's kind of funny, too. I was just driving, 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 rural Pennsylvania, driving, driving, because I went all the way up somewhere and then came back down like an hour and 20 minutes, and I'm driving rural Pennsylvania, and all of a sudden, I come around this little corner, bam, giant Walmart. I was like, I hate Walmart. I mean, I, that's too strong. I shouldn't say I hate it, but it was just like, I was just having this like worship experience, and I'm like, man, where am I? I'm like Lewis and Clark. I'm like exploring Pennsylvania. Come around this corner, giant Walmart. And then I was only like two minutes away from Dee's house. So anyway, woo, I'm on fire, as you might have been able to tell. Welcome to day 29 of DA with DA. We're going to have a good time. And we are in chapter 29, 28, excuse me, chapter 28, titled Levi Matthew. Levi Matthew. And we are about ready to go deep. Okay. Um... I'm going to try not to go too long, but I'm just going to have fun with this, and I hope you guys enjoy it. By the way, just a reminder, remember that tomorrow, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, we will also be meeting in the afternoons, not this late. It'll probably be like, I don't know, one or two Eastern time, so like five or six hours earlier than we are right now. If you can't make the live, that's like right in the middle of the day for a lot of people, and I know that many people have jobs, of course, that don't allow them just to do this. So they'll be archived on both YouTube and on Instagram. So glad you guys are joining. Oh, in fact, I actually had a journal entry. As the plane was descending, I just, I keep a journal every day. It's kind of like a, it's really important to me. I keep several journals actually. And uh, I was going to read you my journal entry from today, but it's on my phone and I didn't send a picture to my email. So I'll read you that journal entry tomorrow. In fact, I'll make a note. Journal entry. It's, it's something I want you to hear because I think it'll be a blessing to you. Okay, journal entry. This desk is really wobbly. Oh, look at that. Whoa, gotta be careful. Okay, let's pray and we're off to the races. Welcome everybody. So glad you're here. Um, whew, this chapter was a masterpiece. I'm just gonna say it. This chapter was a masterpiece. In fact, this might've been my favorite chapter so far. And there've been a whole lot of like, 9.8s, 9.7s, 9.9s. I think for me, this chapter was a 10. 
This chapter was a 10. My only complaint about this chapter is that it should have been like five times longer. I mean, if this chapter, more of this was like 40 or 50 pages long, I would have been so happy. So I think Levi Matthew is my favorite chapter so far. Again, a lot of 9.9s, 9.8s, 9.7s. We've not had a bad chapter yet, in my opinion. Um, but there was something special. Maybe I was just in the zone, the plane, something. But this chapter moved me. It moved me to my core. And we're going to pray and get into it. Welcome, everybody. So glad you're here. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I want to thank you that I am here somewhere in rural Pennsylvania. I want to thank you for D opening his house to me and his home to me. And Lord, I want to pray. I want to thank you, first of all, for getting me here safely. We just take modern travel for granted because it's so easy. You get on a plane, the plane flies through the air, you rent a car, you drive across. I mean, I just did a trip today that centuries ago would have taken weeks or months and Father, we just do it in a morning. And then we land at Whole Foods and we buy food from all over the world. Father, there are so many upsides to modernity. There are significant downsides as well, and we are aware of those. But Father, whatever age, whatever era we find ourselves in, we are so happy that there is a timeless quality to the word, a timeless quality to these great stories and these, these parables, these teachings. And Father, we're going to be in that today. And so I want to thank you for this incredible chapter in this incredible book written by a wonderful, spirit-filled woman. And I pray, Father, for myself now as we talk, as we discuss, and for those that are listening in to day 29 of DA with DA, I just pray this would be everything that it could be. Father, help me in some small way to capture the beauty of this chapter as we discuss, as we talk, as we debrief about this and Father, may Jesus, 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 Jesus be lifted higher and still higher and still higher and still higher so that we have a strong and immovable and fixed sense of who he is and of what he has done for us, for us, for me. Father, it's incredible. And we just stand in awe of the beauty of life, the wonder of life, but above all, the glory of your goodness, grace, mercy, your character, and Jesus, Father Jesus, 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 in whose name we pray, amen and amen and amen. Okay, so we are in chapter 28 of The Desire of Ages, Levi Matthew. There are several passages that this is based on, Matthew 9, Mark 2, and Luke 5. They're all good, and there's, there's little differences um, and I'll probably cite a few of those differences, but I think my favorite, and I've preached on this passage many times before, is probably the Luke, the Lucan account. So I'm going to read Luke chapter 5, looks like it's verses 27 to 39. There we go. Luke chapter 5, verses 27 to 39. This will set us up. We will refer at least to the Matthew account later, and I, I think the Mark account as well. So here we go. Luke chapter 5, beginning in verse 27, After these things he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax office, and he said to him, Follow me. So he left all, rose up, and followed him. Then Levi gave him a great feast in his own house, and there were a great number of tax collectors and others who sat down with them. And their scribes and the scribes and Pharisees complained against his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered and said to them, even though the question was of his disciples, Jesus speaks up, answers the question himself, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. They then said to him, why do the disciples of John fast often and make prayers, and likewise those of the Pharisees, but yours eat and drink? So they turn the question from the disciples, Jesus gives an answer, now they question Jesus. Both of the questions begin with, why? Why do you do it this way? Why are you behaving this way? Why are your disciples behaving this way? There is clearly incredulity, confusion, bewilderment. They don't understand why Jesus does the things he does. And we've talked about the newness, the freshness, the novelty of Jesus' teaching, of his personality, of his interactions, of his social affability. And so people were genuinely confused. Jesus didn't fit nicely and neatly into these boxes that had been crafted for him 
um, by Second Temple Judaism in the first century. And so there's it. Why, why do you and why do they? The confusion is genuine. Now, they're also being a little snarky, a little cheeky, probing, looking for opportunities for accusation. We talked about that last time. But also the questions are legitimate. The confusion is like, why do you behave this way? Okay, verse 34. And he said to them, can you make the friends of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. Then he spoke a parable to them. And I love this parable. I love this parable. I've preached several sermons on it over the years. No one puts a piece from a new garment on an old one. Otherwise, the new makes a tear, and also the piece that was taken out of the new does not match the old. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins, or else the new wine will burst, and the wineskins will be spilled, and the wineskins will be ruined. But new wine must be put into new wineskins, and both are preserved, and no one having drunk old wine immediately desires the new, for he says, the old is better. Okay, now there are slight differences in the Mark and accounts and the Matthew account, but you get a feel for the shape of it here, right? The Luke account, Luke 5, great stuff, great stuff. And again, I just want to say, in my view, this chapter is an absolute masterpiece. And when I read through it the first time, I was like, ooh, ooh, that was good. I like that. I wish that was longer. Read it through the second time, went a little deeper. Read through the third time, went a little deeper. Fourth, a little deeper. Fifth, a little deeper. And I think there was even a six. It was five or six times. And all of a sudden, the captain says, we're beginning our descent. I'm like, what? I, I need to read this through. I feel like I'm just scratching the surface of what's going on here. Um, and at every pass, I felt like I was learning more and, and sort of peeling back, as it were, the layers of the onion. And for me, that's a good thing because I like onions. But, but here's the thing. The thought occurred to me Maybe this chapter isn't the best chapter up to this point. It's just that you had three hours to read it. In all the other chapters, you only have like an hour to an hour and a half. Maybe every chapter would give these kinds of treasures, these kinds of gems, these kinds of discoveries if you had that much time and it just like blew my mind, right? Like it feels like we're spending over an hour basically every day discussing each chapter. So it feels like we're putting our plow pretty deep. But I have the strong sense, beloved, that we're putting our plow, say, a foot down or two foot down. I think there's goodness 10 feet down. I think we could spend, I think we could spend a week alone on each chapter and not feel like, oh, yeah, we've covered that. I mean, there's just so much goodness here. Now, maybe it's possible that this chapter, if even if I only had the hour and a half that I've typically had, hour to an hour and a half, maybe I would have thought, oh, this chapter's a 10. But I have a suspicion that it's not just a coincidence or a serendipity that, oh, the chapter that I've loved the most and valued the most is the one I've spent the most time in. Friends, lesson, lesson. Jesus draws us, his word draws us, and the deeper we go, the better we're blessed. The deeper we go, the more time. And I had that whole drive to, even though I was listening to music and was listening to a podcast for about an hour and a half of it, all, when, when you've put spiritual things in your mind early in the morning, it's on the back burner all day, right? It's just sitting there and you'll hear something in the podcast or you'll hear a song or you'll see a beautiful evening scene and you'll be like, oh, that's like what I read. And I just want to emphasize the importance of this. If you don't make that deposit at some time in the day, preferably in the morning, then you don't have anything on the back burner. But when you make that deposit all day, you're like, oh, that reminds me, all that, all that. And you're literally, I think this is what it means to pray without ceasing and to walk with Jesus every day. doesn't mean you're always on your knees, right, in a posture of prayer, but you can be in an attitude of prayer and reflection all day. And it's so much easier when you've made that deposit and then you've got the whole day to reflect on the thing that you spent time thinking about this morning. Incredible. And then as we're discovering in DA with DA, then the next day adds to that day. Then the next day adds to those two days. Then the next day you see, brrr, it's a journey. And like I said, either the last time we were together or the time before, friends, just have a look at this. Just have a look at this. We're almost a third of the way through this book. In fact, tomorrow's chapter, chapter 29, is 
exactly one third of the way through in terms of chapters, you're going to blink and DA with DA is going to be over. And especially for those of you that are in the rhythm, in the routine of reading every day, and, and some of you even listening most of the days or every day, you're going to be like, kind of like what happens when the students come to a rise. They leave and they're like, whoa, that was, an, that was incredible. That was intense, right? And so I'm so glad that Jesus laid this on my heart to do DA with DA. I'm getting testimony upon testimony of people that are like, man, I'm being so blessed. And I think, yeah, you're being half as blessed as I am, right? Like, anyway, I'll read you that tomorrow in my journal entry. Like the spirit of God just, just moved upon me in such a great way. And I just, it was just quickly inputted on my, in my journal as we were landing. Okay. Um, just a couple things I wrote here. I'm not going to show them to you because you might see my word, but I just wrote at the top of the page, literally, wow, I did not want this chapter to end. I wrote it in my, I wrote it right here. Second thing I wrote is, this chapter is a masterpiece. I'm not making this up. Look, I'll cover this up so you can't see my word. Look at that. Wow, I did not want this chapter to end. This chapter was a masterpiece. And then, look, I wrote all that too. So much goodness. Okay, this is obviously set against the backdrop. This chapter is against the backdrop, as the chapter title suggests, of the call of Levi Matthew. And again, we see that in Matthew 9, Mark 2, and Luke 5. And the call of Levi as a tax collector was radical, unprecedented, unaccountable. Like, people were like, what? What? I mean, because these are two very different classes of people, right? The rabbinical class, the religious of which Jesus was one, right? He was a rabbi. He was a teacher. He was considered a very spiritual person. And those people did not mingle at all, much less easily and freely with tax collectors. And not only did they not mingle, by the way, that word comes up in our chapter today, when Jesus is at Levi Matthew's feast, he's mingling. We'll come back to, we'll come to that in a second. But the idea that a religious leader, a man of piety and of spiritual conviction would call a tax collector to be a part of his inner circle, his believers, his disciples, his devotees, yeah, nah. And Ellen White does a masterful job of painting that in the opening two, two paragraphs. Opening two paragraphs. I'm going to read it. Paragraph one. Of the Roman officials in Palestine, none were more hated than, drumroll, the tax collectors. The fact that taxes were imposed by a foreign power was a continual irritation to the Jews, being a reminder that their independence had departed. And the tax gatherers were not merely the instrument of Roman oppression, they were extortioners on their own account, enriching themselves at the expense of the people. A Jew who accepted this office at the hands of the Romans was looked upon as betraying the honor of his nation. Whoa. He was despised as an apostate and was classed with the vilest of society. Okay, that paints a picture. That gives us a sense for just how radical, just how tectonic and revolutionary it was for Jesus to call Levi Matthew to be not just a believer, but one of his closest disciples, and devotees, okay? It's radical, unprecedented. Paragraph two, this class, or to this class, that is the hated, despised, vile tax collectors, belonged Levi Matthew, who, after the four disciples at Gennesaret, that's the Sea of Galilee, was the next to be called to Christ's service. The Pharisees had judged Matthew according to his employment. The Pharisees said, oh, he's a tax collector? That's everything we need to know. Judging a whole swath of people, a whole class of people, a whole group of people on the basis of one factor. You know one thing about them and you know everything you need to know. Okay? The Pharisees had judged Matthew according to his employment. Three words here, underline these words, but Jesus saw, underline it, but Jesus saw, but Jesus saw, wow. Friends, the same could be said of you and the same could be said of me. Others saw a fill in the blank, 
right? Others saw a purple-haired, aimless punk rocker, but Jesus saw an evangelist, but Jesus saw a teacher, but Jesus saw a father, but Jesus saw a faithful husband, but Jesus saw... So I don't know what it is that the doubters and the haters in your life have said about you or have said to others about you in that sort of rumor mill gossip thing, but it does not matter. That's one of the things that's going to emerge here. Jesus had no time for policy, no time for politics. He was a man of principle. That's going to be one of our big takeaways. He was not actuated by what others thought of him. He was actuated by one thing, and that was principle. And the greatest of all principles, of course, is the principle of love. But Jesus saw. The religious leaders, they said, tax collector, that's everything we need to know. By the way, there are people still in the world like that today. Oh, a black person, that's all I need to know, racism. Oh, a poor person, that's all I need to know, classism. Oh, a fill-in-the-blank person, a non-American, that's all we need to know, nationalism. Right? A Hispanic person, that's all I need to know. Racism slash ethnocentrism. I mean, there are people like that that are just like, all I need to know is the one thing. But Jesus saw. But Je what did Jesus see? But Jesus saw in this man, and you're going to want to underline this, a heart open for the reception of truth. And I'm, I'm on to Ellen White here a little bit. I'm on to Ellen White here. She does this thing where she will, and I've pointed this out before, she will plant a little seed, and this chapter has something about seeds, by the way. She'll plant a little seed in the first paragraph or two that she will then water throughout the chapter and then come back to in the last paragraph or two. She doesn't do it in every chapter, but she often does, and she does it here. And I'm telling you right now, the seed, the thing that just blew my mind away at every reading going deeper and deeper and deeper. Here's the seed. But Jesus saw in this man a heart open. Hold on to that. Hold on to that. A heart open. A heart receptive. Okay? Watch this. Underline that if you're in the habit of underlining. A heart open. I've underlined that and circled the word open. Watch where this goes. This is incredible. For the reception of truth, Matthew had listened to the Savior's teaching as the convicting spirit of God revealed his sinfulness. He longed to seek help from Christ. He longed to seek help from Christ. But he was accustomed to the exclusiveness of the rabbis and had no thought that the great teacher would even notice him. Whoa. I love the insight here. He was so accustomed to the exclusiveness of the rabbis. And we've made this point again and again and again and again. Exclusiveness, bigotry, prejudice, pride, cutting us off from other groups of people on the basis of ethnicity, on the basis of spirituality, on the basis of vocation and employment. And so Matthew has heard, hey, there's this new teacher in town, new preacher, he's very different, very holy, miracle worker. And Matthew's like, wow, maybe... Mate, nah, nah, he's, he's just another one of them. He wouldn't have an interest in me. I mean, she literally says, he was accustomed to the exclusiveness of the rabbis and he had no thought that the great teacher would notice him. Friend, I'm sorry, but I've got to make the application here. Apply that to yourself. As we said the other day, it's very easy to read the promises and to believe that all of those great, amazing, wonderful promises that God makes in scripture are for Ant Hill Farm <laughs> and Duca and Metro 8060 and Sandra Cooper. It's very easy for me to believe that God sees good in others. But friends, God notices you. God notices you. And if your thought is like, well, yeah, there's nothing really special about me or I'm a really big sinner or I'm not the kind of person that could really be useful in God's service, this is Matthew's experience. He's like, yeah, I've heard great things about him, but you know, he's one of he's one of the religious teachers. Probably wouldn't be interested in somebody like me. Five Carsons 05 says, mercy. Exactly. Michelle says, amen. Exactly. Okay. I'm on page 309 now of types and symbols. 
273 of the original. Sitting at his toll booth one day, the tax collector saw Jesus approaching. Great was his astonishment to hear the words addressed to himself, follow me. Great was his astonishment, his incredulity, his amazement. He could not believe his ears because he was hated, he was despised by his own countrymen, but also and especially by those who were loyalists, both religious and national loyalists. And the assumption would be, if Jesus is holier, more spiritual than the scribes and the Pharisees, then his detestation, his hatred for Matthew would be greater to the extent that he was more holy than the religious leaders of the day. And so he was astonished. He was, as the Kiwis would say, gobsmacked. That's what they say in New Zealand, gobsmacked. He was slack jaw. He could not believe it when Jesus goes by the receipt of custom there and says, hey, you look like just the kind of guy I'm looking for. Why don't you follow me? Come be one of my disciples. Come be one of my devotees. Come with me. Come follow. And just reflexively, instinctively, you know, unhesitatingly, he stands up. I'm with this guy. Now, nobody else likes this. The other four disciples do not like it. The religious leaders do not like it. Nobody likes it, okay? So then uh, it says Matthew left all, rose up and followed him. There was no hesitation, no questioning, no thought of the lucrative business to be exchanged for the poverty and hardship. It was enough for him to be with Jesus that he might listen to his words and unite with him in his work. And I just wrote one word in the margin. I just wrote the word acceptance. I want you to feel that word right now. Just let that wash over you acceptance. Jesus receives sinners. He receives them. He welcomes them. He accepts them. In fact, that is going to be the central critique of the religious leaders of Jesus' day, and it's going to be the backdrop of this entire chapter that Jesus hangs out with all the wrong kinds of people, not only hangs out with them, not only mingles with them, not only fraternizes with them, he invites them to be his devotees, his advocates, his disciples, his representatives, his ambassadors, Blech. right? It just made no sense. And again here, it lets us into, it gives us a window into just how radical Jesus was. There was no social, spiritual, cultural box that you could put Jesus into. Um, so, okay, I'm going to just skip that next paragraph. Um... Oh, I, I really like this point. Now I'm in like paragraph four. I'm on page 309, 273 of the original. You know, she basically makes this really great application to, to Matthew and his wealth and Andrew and Peter in their poverty. The same opportunity to make a decision for Jesus was brought to both. One was called out of hardship and adversity. A fisherman, fisher? Being a commercial fisherman is not easy work, right? And it's feast or famine. Right? Like you're either, I have a very, very good friend, one of my closest friends in the world, spent like 25 years as a commercial fisherman. And Adrian told me, you're either making money hand over fist or you're spending money hand over fist. The motor's broke, the boat's broke, the nets are broke, the fish aren't biting, the wind is wrong, the tide is wrong. Right? Like being a commercial fisherman, that's hard, hard work. And Matthew's job was a cushy job. It was an easy job, right? Because his job was basically to extract money from the population, the Jewish population, hand it over to the Romans, and then siphon a little bit off the top for himself. And so one of the reasons they were despised is they were wealthy, right? By, compar by comparison with the surrounding culture and society and community that they lived in, they were wealthy. So Matthew's called out of his affluence. Peter and the others were called out of their adversity, but she says both were called. Both had to respond to Jesus. And I love the fact that Jesus meets us wherever we are. God calls men, God calls women. God calls the educated and the uneducated. God calls the rich and the poor. God calls the American and the non-American. God calls the Jew and the Gentile. God calls the young and the old. And we all meet Jesus' invitation and call at the place where we are. By the way, Ellen White's going to have a paragraph in just a little bit that's just mind-blowing on that very point. Okay. So um, she does make a really good point about how the call of Matthew was at the time, of course, when the boats were overflowing almost to the point of sinking with fish. And she says that at the moment of success, when the nets were filled with fish, 
the impulses of, and the impulses of the old life were the strongest, Jesus asked the disciples at the sea to leave all and work for the gospel. It looked promising. It looked like this might be just the thing to turn the family fishing business. And Jesus is like, now you can trust me. I can take care of your needs. And as with Levi and Matthew, Peter and the other, no hesitation. No questioning, no hesitancy. Yep, that's our guy. Now again, we know that their understanding of what Messiah was and who he would, what he would do and how he would behave and the things he would accomplish, they do not yet understand. But still, there was a certain, there was a certain quality to Jesus' character, his tone, his voice that attracted them, drew them, wooed them, and he won their loyalty. Again, not by driving it with fear and shame, but by drawing with the promise of opportunity. From now on, you'll catch, you'll be fishers of men now. From now on, you're going to catch men. Really like that. Um, then she talks about how, this is a great paragraph, begins with the sentence, principle is always exacting. Principle doesn't move. Politics can move. Policies can move. Principle doesn't move. Principle doesn't move. She says, principle is always exacting. No man can su succeed in the service of God unless his whole heart is in the work and he counts all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. She's quoting here, you might want to write it in the margin, Philippians chapter 3 verse 8, one of my top 10 favorite Pauline passages, Philippians 3, but what things were gained to me, those I count but lost for Christ, yea, doubtless, and I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of, Christ Jesus." Love it. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things that are behind and reaching forward under those things that are before, I press on toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. That passage, a hundred sermons in those verses that I just quickly quoted. And Ellen White quotes that here. And, 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 I'm going to give you a little hint, a little hint. That passage in Philippians 3, that passage in Philippians 3, now listen to this, is a passage about I'm probably going to give you too much, but I'm going to say it anyway. That passage in Philippians 3 is a passage about Paul being emptied and then filled. I just gave you everything. I just gave you everything, but you're going to get to see it. That passage, she strategically quotes that passage. And that is Paul about being emptied of all of the things that he thought was for his benefit and his gain. He was, he was, he thought he was rich. He became impoverished so that Jesus could make him rich. He thought he was full. Jesus made him empty so that he could be filled. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Um, I got to read this paragraph here, bottom of page 309. The calling of Matthew to be one of Christ's disciples excited great indignation. I don't know if you know that word, indignation. It means righteous anger. Righteous, oh, Puerto Puerto says, my word was empty. You're close. You're close. I mean, where I was at. I mean, yours is great. Praise the Lord. That's what Jesus gave you. I cannot wait to share with you where this chapter goes. <sighs> Listen to this. The calling of Matthew to be one of Christ's disciples excited great indignation. Jesus violated a kind of code here a Jewish code, a rabbinical code, a religious leader's code. He normalized, he normalized free association and even em employment of a tax collector? No, no and no. People were angry. People were angry. Jesus' own disciples didn't like it. Nobody liked it, except Jesus and Levi and Matthew. <laughs> and, as we're going to see, Levi and Matthew's fellow tax collectors, they thought it was pretty cool, because there's going to be a party, and Jesus is going to attend this party. Scandalous. Absolutely scandalous. Man, Scripture is incredible. I hope if DA with DA does nothing else for you, it just gives you such an appreciation for the depth of, of Scripture, the beauty of Scripture, and of the incredible, incomparable, illimitable beauty of Jesus Christ. Man, we should be more in love with Jesus at the end of this than when we started. That's how I feel. 
already, and we're not even a third of the way through. Excited indignation for a religious teacher to choose. Ugh, I almost have to spit when I say it. For a religious teacher to choose a tax collector as one of his immediate attendants was an offense against the religious, social, and national customs. <laughs> Jesus, he's out of control. He cannot be contained. He, and yet Jesus is operating not by politics, not by perception, not by policy. Jesus is operating by principle. Say it with me. What principle? The principle of love. The principle of loving self-sacrifice. The principle upon which the whole nature and character of God is built. By appealing to the prejudices of the people. I'm on the next page now. 310, 274, 275 of the original. There's our word again. We talked about this yesterday. Prejudices and bigotry. Prejudice and bigotry. By appealing to the prejudices of the people, the Pharisees hope to turn the current of popular feeling among Jesus. Jesus has gone too far here. This is a bridge too far. I mean, have you heard the latest? Have you heard? Yeah, we've heard he's done some good healings and he has some nice things to say, but have you heard the latest? They literally believe that this was the kind of thing that could create a sufficient scandal, that this could create sufficient white noise on the sort of, you know, rumor mill grapevine that people be like, ooh, that's a bridge too far. But Jesus is only getting started with his willingness to completely upend the traditions and customs and policies of the religious leaders of his day. He's just getting started, but they're scandalized by it. Absolutely scandalized. And so the religious leaders literally believe that they could turn this into an opportunity for them to decrease Jesus' influence. Right? So... Then she's, I'm sorry, I've just got to keep reading. Among the tax collectors, a widespread interest was created. Again, nobody liked this except for Jesus and Levi Matthew and Levi Matthew's fellow tax collectors because, hey, if the great teacher, if the great healer would associate and affiliate himself with one of us, then maybe it's not just Levi Matthew. Maybe it could be all of us. Levi Matthew senses this and having that initial evangelistic impulse that, that new believers often do, they're like, hey, I need to let my family members know. I need to let my friends know. My community members know. My coworkers know. So he has a party and he invites his friends. Well, the only people that would typically be the friend of a tax collector would be other tax collectors and unsavory types, right? The unmentionables, sinners, Gentiles, the people that are from the wrong side of the tracks, so to speak. So Matthew throws a party. In honor of Jesus. And then he invites Jesus to come. And do I even need to say it? Jesus accepts the invitation. Scandal upon scandal, layer upon layer, right? Among the tax collectors, a widespread interest was created. Their hearts were drawn, there's our word, toward the divine teacher in the joy of his new discipleship in the joy of his new discipleship. Hear that, hear that. In the joy of his new discipleship, Matthew longed to bring his former associates to Jesus. Can relate, can relate. I wanted to bring my punk rock friends, my bandmates, my community. I wanted to bring them to Jesus. I wanted them to experience what I had experienced. Matthew longed to bring his former associates to Jesus. Accordingly, he made a feast at his own house and called together his relatives and friends not only were tax collectors included, but many others who were of doubtful reputation and who were proscribed by their more scrupulous neighbors. Oh, that's just so well said. And it's funny. I actually wrote funny in the margin there. I just like the way that Ellen White says, you know, those who were of, many others who were of doubtful reputation, who were proscribed, that means under condemnation and social you know, separation from the more scrupulous neighbors. You know, tongue is planted firmly in cheek here. It's great writing. Great writing. The entertainment was given in honor of Jesus, and he did not hesitate to accept the courtesy. By the way, a little play there. M don't miss this. Matthew did not hesitate to accept the invitation of Jesus to be his disciple, and Jesus did not hesitate to accept the celebration, the joy of his newfound discipleship, and he threw a party for Jesus without hesitation. And Jesus is like, yeah, I'd love to come. 
Oh, yeah, yeah. A bunch of your friends are going to be there? A bunch of your family members? Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, I'd love to come. It would be safe to say there was probably not a single other religious leader, scrabi, or scrabi, <laughs> scribe, rabbi. It's funny when you combine words. Just yesterday, I was talking to a, a fellow that I just met yesterday, lovely guy, and he was talking about, we were talking about how you spend money on things that are on sale. You know how that is? Like, oh, I had to buy it. It was on sale. And I'd never heard this word before, but he said, oh, that's called spaving. Has anybody heard that before? <laughs> spaving. Spaving. Yeah, I had to buy it. It was 50% off. Spaving. And so, uh, scrabi, right? Scribes, rabbis, elders, Pharisees. It's safe to say no other religious leader is going to, A, call one of the most vile and hated you know, a member of one of the most vile and hated classes in first century, you know, Judaism, that's not going to happen. And number two, if a party was thrown of those kinds of people, the icky people, the on the outside looking in type of people, no one's going to that party. And Jesus is like, oh, I'd love to come. Yeah, without hesitation, she says. Without hesitation. He did not hesitate to accept the courtesy. He well knew that this would, he knew that this would give offense to the Pharisee party and would also compromise him in the eyes of the people. Mind blown. Mind blown. He knows that accepting this invitation will cause offense among his fellow religious leaders, even though he's, they're not really his fellows, but he wants them to be. But he knows that he will actually lose influence with just rank and file Jews for doing this, and he doesn't care. Feel the bravery of that. Feel the incredible, radical courage of that. He's like, yeah, I don't care what the crowd thinks. This is the right thing to do, and we should do what is right because it is right and leave the consequences with God. Jesus is actuated by principle, not politics, not policy, not perspective. He's not a reed blown in the wind. He's a man of firm, immovable principle. Whoa! He knew, he well knew that this would give offense to the Pharisee party. It would also compromise him in the eyes of the people. But no question of policy could influence his movements. Listen to this. With him, external distinctions weighed nothing. Oh, that moves my heart. That's our Savior, friends. This is what the Bible means again and again and again when it says that God shows no partiality. God shows no partiality. It's exactly this exact phrase. With God, external distinctions weigh nothing. Rich, poor means nothing. Oh, your skin tone is lighter than my skin tone, darker than my skin tone. Your nationality is not my nationality. God looks at it and says, all of the candidates of my kingdom, all of them potential children of God, everyone, all of that stuff that we make a big, not hopefully not as believers, but that human beings make a big deal about Jesus. He's like, that's, you know, yeah, he's a tax collector. He's also made in the image of God. He's also one of my children. <sighs> I love that. With him, external distinctions weighed nothing. Thank you, Jesus. That which appealed to his heart was a soul thirsting for the water of life. Sorry, I'm going to keep reading. Jesus sat as an honored guest at the table of the tax collectors by his sympathy and social kindness kindliness, showing that he recognized, I love this, the dignity of humanity, the dignity of humanity. That's why these external differences, distinctions meant nothing to him, because he saw that every single person, whether the lowest of the low in the social strata or the highest of the high, whether Jew or Gentile, Samaritan, it didn't matter. Every one of them bore, I love this phrase, the dignity of humanity. And men long to become worthy of his confidence. Upon their thirsty hearts, that's the second time she uses thirsty there, she used it in the last paragraph, his words fell with blessed life-giving power, new impulses were awakened, and I love this, and the possibility of a new life opened to these outcasts of society. Whoa! What a cool concept! That, that Jesus was giving them an out. He was giving them a new life, a new opportunity, a new lease on life. And probably most of us on this chat know what it's like. Or those that are listening on YouTube know what it's like to have made decisions over the course of your life and you feel trapped. You feel trapped by your choices. You feel trapped by your economics. You feel trapped by 
the situation, maybe bad decisions that you made or your parents made or others made or your health situation or whatever, you feel trapped. Friends, do you know what God holds out to people that feel trapped? The opportunity for a new life, a whole new life oriented not toward the difficulties and adversities of external circumstances, but toward God himself. And if God is with us, who can be against us, right? So that's how the tax collectors are feeling. They're feeling like, hey, maybe we can be different than people think of us. Because very often, people become what we expect of them. They behave in the ways that we expect them to behave, right? We often talk about how God's word is creative. It has a creative power. Let there be light and there's light. Let there be dry land and there's dry land. I got news for you. Your words have creative power. I want you to feel that. Your words have creative power. If you say to somebody, you're stupid. Why did you do that? You're an idiot. You're just the kind of person that would make that terrible mistake. You literally create that reality when you speak it into people's lives. But the converse is also true. When we say, I think you're, I think you're, I think you're going to do this. I think you're just the right person. I think you've got this. I believe in you. And God believes in you. And when we speak that way into people's lives, even for people who don't have faith, just like our story with the paralytic through the roof, through the ceiling, they can lay hold on our faith. We need to see a future and a possibility and a potential for those around us that can't see a future and a potential and a possibility for themselves. If people can't cling to faith, have faith for them. Help them to see through the eyes of Yahweh, through the eyes of Jesus, that God is not limited in what is possible in the life of anybody. Tax collector, outcast of society, I love that. New impulses were awakened in these outcasts, these sinners, these tax collectors, the vilest members of society. And the possibility of a new life opened up to these outcasts. Friends, feel that. How often is the Christian church accused of, and sometimes we've earned the reputation of looking at people and saying, yeah, condemnation, yeah, probably not going to make it, yeah, don't belong here. Like, we foist upon the people around us this sort of tight, tightly defined window of what religion is and what religion looks like, and we basically alert people to the fact whether, yeah, I don't think you're going to make it. We might never say that, but we are saying that through the ways that we treat people and the ways that we mingle or don't mingle with people. We are creating often, not always, and not all churches and not all people, but too often the Christian church creates a climate not of success, not of belief, not of faith that creates faith, but of, yeah, yeah, I don't, I'm not sure this is for you, not Jesus. Jesus interacted with people in such a way that they were like, I think this guy believes in me. We've all seen those sports scenes, right? We've all seen those sports scenes where the sport movie, whatever the movie is, it almost, almost all sports movies, and there are some good ones, they have that scene, right? It's like in the last 10 to 15 minutes of the movie where the coach gives the speech. We're down. We're not expected to win, but I believe in you. I love everybody in this locker room. You can do it. And everybody, what happens? All the players who don't think, like, no, we're outmanned. We're outgunned. We're not as strong. We're not as fast. Our star player is injured, whatever it is. What they do is they lay hold on the coach's belief in them. And they begin to believe in the coach's belief in them. By the way, this is exactly how the gospel works. One of my all-time, all-time, all-time favorite, and I don't often say this, and I'm being a little vulnerable here. This is totally unscripted, completely off the cuff. So I hope I don't offend anybody here. But one of my all-time favorite stories is the story written by Alexander Dumas, the Count of Monte Cristo. And uh, 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 apologies if you find this offensive, but I'm going to tell it to you anyway. So the, the book, The Count of Monte Cristo, is like 1,500 pages. It's gigantic. Um, I've read it. It's amazing. And the movie is much, 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 much smaller. The movie is like 5%, literally, in terms of the plot line of what the book is. But there's this great scene. In, it's kind of, in the movie, it's actually a little better than in the book. For the most part, the book is much better. But there's this great, great, great scene. And I don't want to give away too much here. But, but the Count of Monte Cristo, the man who will become the Count of Monte Cristo, 
is speaking to a priest and the priest is dying. And the priest says to the man that will become the Count of Monte Cristo is, is um, Edmund Dantes. He's speaking to Edmund Dantes and he says, the priest says to him, the priest is about ready to die. And he says, do not commit the crime for which you now serve the sentence. And then he says, when you find the treasure, use it for good. And then Edmund Dantes, who's in prison at this point, says, you know that I won't use it for good. I will use it for vengeance. And then uh, he says, the priest quotes to him, and he's just like, these are his last breaths. He's dying. And he says, remember, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Vengeance belongs to me. And then Edmund Dantes says to the priest, he says, I don't, but I don't believe in God. And the priest, these are his last words. He says, it doesn't matter. God believes in you. Oh, I get chills even now just thinking about it. That scene, you could put that on loop. I could watch that a hundred times. It doesn't matter. He believes in you. There's a great Jill Phillips song about this. When you rise up just to fall again, God believes in you, right? And so I just love this idea that so much of the story of scripture, and she's painting it here, is that we lay hold on what God sees. Remember, but Jesus saw. But Jesus saw. We lay hold on that. And we say, no, I I think, I'm just gonna trust that Jesus sees things that I can't see. He discerns things that I can't discern. Okay, I gotta get moving here. Um, Oh, then she talks about seeds. Seeds. Um, That's the next paragraph. I'm still on page 310. I'm going really slow here. At such gatherings as this, not a few were impressed by the Savior's teaching who did not acknowledge him until after his resurrection and ascension. When the Holy Spirit was poured out, there's the water analogy, and the 3,000 were converted in a day, there were among them many who first heard the truth at the table of the tax collectors. And some of these became messengers of the gospel. To Matthew himself, the example of Jesus at the feast was a constant lesson. I underline that. That's so cool. Matthew never forgot that Jesus attended his party. Jesus hung out with his friends. And at this time, we have no indication that others became believers right then, but she says seeds were sown. And after the resurrection and ascension, many of those that had sat with Jesus at that party, at that table, became followers of Messiah. Jesus was so strategic, so wise, always planting a seed here, planting a seed here, knowing that the Holy Spirit, when it was poured out, would water those seeds and they would spring up into everlasting life. And Matthew never forgot that. She says it. To Matthew himself, the example that Jesus set at the party, at the feast, was a constant lesson. She then goes on to talk about the presence of Jesus. I'm gonna move on just a little bit quicker here. Okay, okay. I'm on the next page now, 311. I just skipped a couple paragraphs. She talks about how, you know, it was the policy of the religious leaders to accuse the disciples to Jesus and then to accuse Jesus to the disciples, trying to create dissension, trying to create division, They're the accusers. They're acting out the very satanic nature who, you know, Satan is the accuser of the brethren. And so to the disciples, they accuse Jesus. And to Jesus, they accuse the disciples. They're trying to create dissent in the ranks. Okay, part of the dissent is created by asking two why questions. Why? And the first of the two why questions is, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Question the envious rabbis. Envious of what? Envious of the popularity, the rising tide of popularity that Jesus was experiencing. They're envious because they're basically politicians at heart. Jesus is a man of principle. They're men of policy, men of politics, looking where the wind is blowing. And they see that Jesus is winning the attention and the affection of the people and they're envious. And so they ask the question, why does your master eat with tax collectors and sinners? And I circled the word why, and I literally wrote this in my margin. They couldn't even conceive of the motivation. They couldn't even understand the motivation. And I love the way that Mark, you might want to make a note of this, in the Markan account, Mark in chapter 2, verse 16, Mark chapter 2, verse 16, rather than the why, this is how it's put in Mark. How is it that your master eats with tax collectors and sinners? How is that? 
Jesus was playing chess and everybody else is playing checkers. They're not even playing checkers. They're playing tic-tac-toe and Jesus is playing like four-dimensional chess, right? Like they can't even conceive of the facts. The same thing that happened with the woman at the well. When Jesus says, hey, don't you guys say there's four months and then comes the harvest? I'm, if you can see what I see, you could lift up your eyes right now and you would see, see the fields are already white for the harvest. They, the religious leaders, could not conceive of what? Why would a pious, godly, committed, religious man hang out with the outcasts of society, the vilest members? Jesus is playing four-dimensional chess. Jesus is on a whole nother level. And so that, why? These are genuine questions. They don't know the answer. Now, they're disingenuous in the sense that they're trying to trap Jesus. They're trying to create dissent. But they genuinely had no frame of reference to put Jesus' accessibility, his approachability, his affability. They had no place to put it. How is it? Can't you feel their amazement? Can't you feel their incredulity? They're just like, what is up with your master? Oh, I just love it. Um... Then Jesus says, ooh, this is big. He Two times in this, par in this uh, chapter, Ellen White quotes what Jesus says. Go learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Write it down. Hosea 6.6. 6. Hosea 6.6. 6, and also mingled with Hosea 6.6 6 is Micah 6.6-8. 6, 6 he has shown you, O man, what is good. And what the Lord requires of you to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk, love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Hosea 6, 6, Micah 6, 6 to 8 are all wrapped up in that. Go learn what this means. And this is not the last time Jesus will give this advice to religious people. Yeah, yeah, I know you're concerned. Yeah, yeah, I know you're scandalized. Yeah, yeah, I know you don't understand. How about this? How about you go back to your own book, to your own prophets, to your own history, to your own heritage? And go learn what this means. I desire, Yahweh desires mercy, not sacrifice. And then come and get back to me. This is not the last time Jesus will quote this passage. Again, Hosea 6, 6, Micah 6, 6 to 8. Um, this is, of course, part of the larger answer that Jesus gives in answer to the question, why? Because they ask the question, why does your master, they ask it of the disciples, Jesus overhears it, and he gives the answer. And he's like, hey, you're not going to pick on my disciples. You're not going to pick on my boys, right? You're trying to find the weak link to create division and dissent. So Jesus answers, to those that are well do not have need of a physician, but those that are sick, but go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Remember, repentance means the change of mind. Now, she goes on to say that the religious leaders regarded the tax collectors and non-Jewish peoples and the outcasts of society, lepers, and others as possessing a kind of spiritual disease. They literally thought of them as sick. And in the case of things like leprosy or blindness or lameness, the external disease was an evidence of the internal perversion of moral character, as they thought. So Jesus is actually playing, again, on their ground. Hey, you guys are the ones that say that all these people have a moral sickness. So, well, I've come to heal people. I've come to help people. I've come to save people. And those that are well, right? Wink, wink, nod, nod. Well, they don't need a physician, but these people do. They've asked a question of incredulity. Why does your teacher, how is it that he, Jesus gives an answer? And they're just like, they got no answer. They got nowhere to put this. I love what Jen's fair lady says here. There was no box that Jesus fit in, in the eyes of the Pharisees. That's exactly right. 100%. Um, then she says here, just make a note of this next paragraph. They were in a worse condition than those that they regarded as diseased sinners. She says they were in a worse condition. Just write this down quickly if you're taking notes. Underline worse condition and write down pages. This is in my um, version. Oh, I should probably look these up for you. If you're reading types and symbols, Write down pages 285 and 300. 285 and 300. And I'll just read you those two. I'll go back and find the originals. Um, listen to this. Um, this is on page 267 of the original pagination. Listen to this. 
Yet often these very ones who exalted themselves as holy were more guilty than the sufferers they condemned. More guilty, here she says, worse condition. Okay, I'll give you one more. This is 285 of types and symbols. 285 of types and symbols, this just came to me. These threads that Ellen White is pulling through again and again. 285, this is 257 of the original. 257 of the original. Their condition was more hopeless than that of the demoniac. So don't miss that. Don't miss that. More hopeless. More hopeless. And uh, what was the other one? More guilty. More hopeless. More guilty. Worse condition. They were really in a worse condition than the ones they despised. The tax collectors were less bigoted. There's our word again. There's our word again. They were less bigoted and self-sufficient and thus were more open. Remember, remember, I told you, you know where this is going. Open, open like a jar, open like a vessel, open to receive something. Because this whole chapter is about being full being emptied, and being refilled. And I'll just, I'll just give it to you a little bit right now because some aren't going to stay on for the whole enchilada. Some aren't going to stay on for the whole thing. Are you ready for this? I'm just going to tell you right now. This is the punchline. And then if you want to tune out, or, you know, you got to go put your kids to bed or something. I'm going to tell you what the punchline of this chapter is right now. Because this is kind of about where we normally end, about an hour and 15 minutes, hour and 20 minutes. Here's the punchline. Friends, listen to me. I counted... More than 70 times, more than 70 times in this one chapter. Remember, I read it through like five or six times because the first time, then the second, it just kept getting deeper and deeper and bigger and better. 70 plus references to full or empty or fill or filled as in the context of, you ready? Fasting and feasting. That's, what's the, that's what this chapter is about. Fasting, which is what? An empty stomach. Feasting is what? A full stomach. The whole chapter, 70 plus times, revolves around the idea of being empty or filled or full, fasting and feasting. And the religious leaders of Jesus' day were like, no, it's fasting. It's fasting. Why do your disciples not fast? Right? Because this is what's going to happen with the, the uh, disciples of John the Baptist. So you have this fasting, feasting thing. The, is the stomach empty or is the stomach full? Is the vessel empty or is the vessel full? 70 plus times. And, and she, you go through it, see if you can find them. You might find more than me. She, she just, again and again and again, she talks about open up, ready to receive. They were empty, they were filled, empty, full. It's incredible. And of course, what are the parables that Jesus tells? One of the parables that he tells is the parable of no one fills old wineskins with new wine. Because if you do, then the wineskins will burst and they'll be empty. You have to put new wine into new wineskins. All of this is so beautiful, so incredible. What Jesus is saying is you cannot mingle my messianic identity and my approach with the old way of thinking and doing religion and Judaism. Something's going to break. Something's going to break. And the only way, the reason that you don't know, why does your, how is it that, because you're full. She uses this language. She uses all kinds of language. They were self-sufficient. She says they consider themselves spiritually whole. They thought they were full. And of course, of course, I'm giving you everything now. It's just all falling out of me. I was going to sort of reveal it like a little bit, but I can't, I can't. I just, I got to let you know. Where does she end up? Of course, she ends up in the Laodicean message. She ends up in Revelation chapter three. You think you are full, but in fact, you are empty. So you should come to me so you can be full. Amazing. And she uses all kinds of language to describe the perception or the self-diagnosis of fullness that the religious leaders had. Self-sufficiency, uh, they thought they were, she, uses, she even uses the word self-justifying. In fact, there's one other gigantic thing here that I'm, I'm gonna save to the end. 
There's two big ones here, and one is the whole full, empty, full motif. Full, empty, full motif. That's one of the big things. That is the thing that's going on in this chapter. And so I might as well just tell you, the word, the word is filled. The word is filled. The word is filled. Filled. And I, there's one more little thing on there I don't want you to see. Because everybody's filled. That's the point. Everybody's filled. We're either filled with self, self-centered religion that excludes and need, leaves no room or space for Jesus' new wine to come in, Jesus' new teachings, Jesus' new way, or we're filled with Jesus. <laughs> we're all full of it. The question is, what is it? Everybody's full. Full of what? That's the question. Now, I got another big gem that's coming. Okay, okay, okay. So I'm back on that page here. Oh, and now, now just listen to the sentence again. Listen to the sentence I just read and hear this. But although the Pharisees thought so highly of themselves, full, they were really in a worse condition than the ones that they despised. Actually empty. The tax collectors were less bigoted thought they were empty, but they were actually less bigoted and less self-sufficient, full, and thus were more open to the influence of truth. I want to encourage you to go back. If you can't do it tonight, do it tomorrow. Find some time this week. Get a highlighter, get a marker, get a, some color, some pen, and read through this chapter again and see how many references you can find to, I wrote them all down here, full, empty, filled, Fill, feasting, fasting, I found more than 70. I think it was 72. <laughs> oh, man. Woo! Okay. Th let's keep going there. Oh, then she quotes it again. Um, Jesus said to the rabbis, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Thus he showed that while they, we're going to circle back around to that in just a little bit. Thus he showed that while they claimed to expound the word of God, they claimed to know what the Bible was teaching, they were wholly ignorant of its spirit. Highlighted it. You know what this means? It means that they knew details about individual trees, but they couldn't see the forest. They, could, they, they knew individual passages. Many of these religious leaders could have quoted whole psalms. They could have quoted... Some of them would have had entire books of Torah memorized. And so they would have known... The details, the technicalities, the verbiage, the rabbinical uh, exposition. But she says, even though they knew a lot about Scripture, they were wholly ignorant of the spirit of Scripture. This is why Jesus, in that big uh, argument slash monologue that he had in John chapter 5, said, you guys search the Scriptures, you pour over the Scriptures, you brood over the Scriptures, because in them you think you have eternal life. You think that Scripture is an end in itself. Ooh, this might be a tough pill for some of you to swallow. But scripture is not an end in itself. What makes scripture so special, Jesus said, is that it's a story about me. It's a story about God's faithfulness and Messiah is the embodiment, the manifestation, the incarnation of God's faithfulness on earth. And they thought scripture was the thing. No, scripture is about the thing. And the thing is God. Theologians call this theocentricity, theocentricity, that scripture is not like a code book. Remember back in the day, there were these like code books and all of these like, you know, the idea that you could line up almost in crossword style or word find type, you line it all up and you can, ooh, scripture, that's not what's going on here. Scripture is a story. Scripture is a narrative. It's a narrative about God's faithfulness to Abraham and his descendants and to the whole human race through Abraham and his descendants. But when Abraham and his descendants failed in their call to be missional and faithful and proclaimers and ambassadors, God raised up Jesus, who was a descendant of Abraham. He becomes Israel and God's faithfulness. People know that Jesus is the hero of the story, but they don't know why. The reason that Jesus is the hero of the story is that he's the means by which God kept the promise that he made to the earth through Abraham and his descendants. In Incredible. So Jesus says, hey, fellas, 
you know the text in some sort of technical ways, inside and outside. But she says they're wholly ignorant of the Spirit. So they couldn't understand. Why would Jesus be hanging out with the wrong people, with the outcasts, with tax collectors? How is it? They didn't know where to put it. They had nowhere to put it. Okay, okay, a little bit more here. A little bit more here. I'm just going to go fast. I'm on page 312, 276 of the original. Now, when Jesus came mingling with the people, eating and drinking at their tables, they accused him of being a glutton and a drunkard, right? Full, he's eating so much. He's hanging out with the wrong people. Here again, and this is like the third or the fourth time she said it, mingling with the people. We have a God who mingles. You know what the word mingle means? It means hangs out. Hangs out. God is the kind of guy that you'd want to have over to your house. He would love to hang out with you. God wants to be with you, right? He wants to hang out with you. This is why sometimes, as I mentioned before, I don't like the way that Jesus is depicted and portrayed in a lot of these religious films because he comes off as aloof and austere and disconnected and unapproachable and kind of just weird. God, Jesus was the most natural easy to hang out with, easy to approach, easy to talk to person. People couldn't understand it. He was simultaneously completely holy, completely principled, and totally approachable and affable. No one knew where to put it. And so when they threw a big party, when Matthew threw a big party in the name of Jesus, he's like, I'd love to come. That's just what I would love to do is hang out with you and your friends, Matthew. Please, please let me come. And the people were scandalized. So then they do this little thing where Jesus says, hey, when John the Baptist came and he was eating locusts and wild honey and clothed with camel hair and living in the desert, you said, oh, this guy's a fanatic. This guy's got a demon. But the son of man comes eating and drinking and you say he's a glutton and a wine bibber. Right? They didn't know where to put Jesus. They didn't know where to put John the Baptist either. Um, oh, man, so much. Um... I'm still on page 312. Is there anything here I want to say? Uh, I got my big, big thing here. This is why they asked the second why question. Why do, your, uh, why do we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples do not fast? Again, the big orbit here is around feasting versus fasting. And just remember, feasting is a place where your stomach gets full, where you get filled with something. Fasting is where your stomach is empty. Okay, so feasting, fasting. Full, empty. Okay, and so the question is, why do your disciples, your disciples aren't fasting? And then the answer is, and Jesus uses, and Ellen White makes this point, the answer is the very same answer that John the Baptist gave. When John the Baptist was told, hey, people are following Jesus and not you, he's becoming more popular. He said, well, I'm just the friend of the bridegroom. I'm just the friend of the bridegroom. I'm not the bridegroom. I'm not the guy. I'm the friend of the guy. And then Jesus picks up on that very same analogy of John's, which all of John's disciples would have immediately detected. And he purposefully says, listen, this is not the time for fasting. Are you kidding? We're having a great time. The gospel is going out. The sick are being healed. People are coming to faith. People are coming to repentance. There's going to be a time, he says, for fasting. They'll fast and mourn, but that time is not now. This is a time for celebration. This is a time for feasting. This is a time for joy. Right now, he's referencing, and she actually says this, He's referencing the fact that he knows that, as she says, a dark shadow lays over his future. But he's the only one that knows this. Nobody else knows it. But in answer to the question, why don't your disciples fast like the other disciples do? He said, this isn't a time for fasting. This is a time for joy, for celebration, for feasting. This is a time for all of us to be enjoying the company of one another, the company of angels, unseen angels, and the company of Yahweh. Oh, and this was so good. I mentioned this earlier. I'm on page 313, 277. This was too good. The prince of heaven was among his people. Now, you might be tempted when you read that to think, oh, she means the Jews. No, no, no. When you read the context of what she's saying, his people were the lepers, the Samaritans, the outcasts, the sinners, the tax collectors. The prince of heaven was among his people. The greatest gift of God had been given to the world. And then I love this. Joy to the poor, for Christ had come to make them heirs of the kingdom. Joy to the rich, 
for he would teach them how to secure eternal riches. Joy to the ignorant! He would make them wise unto salvation. Joy to the learned! He would open to them deeper mysteries than they had ever fathomed. Truths that had been hidden from the foundation of the world would be opened to men by the Savior's mission. Notice here again, opened, opened. Open for what purpose? For receiving, being filled. Joy to the world. I just love that. Joy to the rich, joy to the ignorant, joy to the poor, joy to the learned. Ah, oh, this was, a, she says, this was not a time for them to mourn and fast. They must be open. They must open their hearts to receive the light of his glory. But across, she says, but across his life lay a heavy shadow that his eye alone could discern. Next page. Ooh, I got a lot going on here. Oh, yeah. Okay, here's a gem. We just hit something with our shovel. In, at the top of page 314, 278 of the original, we're digging, and we just, we just hit something big with our shovel. This is a big gem, and you're going to love it. Are you ready for this? When he should come forth from the tomb, their sorrow would be turned to joy. Okay? You know what I wrote right here? Christ's empty tomb, remember the whole theme is empty filled. Empty filled. Right? Here's what I wrote. Because she goes straight to the empty tomb. Christ's empty tomb enables your full life. Yes. Reach that. Christ's empty tomb enables your... Empty tomb enables your full life. Come on now. She, this isn't David Asterick making this up. This is what she's doing. But you probably don't get this on the first pass. I didn't get it until like the second, third pass. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. I see what she's doing. The whole chapter is built around this Filled, empty, filled motif. The tomb was filled with the body of Jesus. It was emptied of the body of Jesus. So our lives could be filled with the Holy Spirit. Man, she's writing on another level. This is Holy Spirit inspired stuff, beloved. The Spirit of God was moving. The, the idea of open versus closed. Filled versus empty. Mm, Christ's empty tomb enables your full life. This chapter here has numerous references to joy, 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 rejoicing. Um, oh, and I just made a note here. It's, I thought this is quite interesting. When Jesus says, yeah, the time will come when there will be mourning and fasting, because they're like, hey, why don't your disciples fast like the disciples of John do and the Pharisees do? And then Jesus says, oh, the time will come for fasting. But you know, I had this incredible thought. The time for fasting was very short. They only fasted for that little moment when they thought Jesus was dead. I mean, mourned and fasted. When they thought Jesus was dead, as soon as they figured out he's alive, he's risen, the Holy Spirit was outpoured, and it was time for feasting again. <laughs> so really, the time for fasting was just a few short days before they realized that the promise of the Father, the reception of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, it's like 50 days. Right from the from Passover to Pentecost is 50 days. So it's what the name Pentecost means. So even that period of fasting was short-lived. Here's what I wrote in the margin. Really a very short time since Christ's resurrection and ascension, the time for fasting has passed. The outpouring of Christ's presence in the Holy Spirit, that's the time we're living in. We're not living in the dispensation of mourning and fasting right now. We're living in the dispensation that our Savior, our elder brother Jesus, conquered sin, conquered death, conquered the grave. He's seated at the right hand of God. Friends, we've got a lot to be thrilled about, joyful about. It doesn't mean that we can't have periods of repentance and reflection and introspection. Of course, we can have all of those things. It doesn't mean it's not a time for being aware of the crucial hour of Earth's history in which we're living. Yes, yes, yes. But none of that eclipses the great joy that Christ is alive he is not here. He's risen. Come see the tomb where he used to be because the tomb was filled with the body of Jesus. It was empty to the body of Jesus and now your life can be filled with joy. Full, empty, full. She does it again and again. Just go read it again. You'll see it and you'll be like, there it is. David wasn't kidding. He didn't make it up. He didn't make it up. Man, I was having a worship experience on that plane today. I was just like, I didn't, I didn't see anybody around me, turbulence, Cookies, pretzels, peanuts, 
nap. I was in this place with Jesus. Woo, okay. Oh, here we go. The Pharisees sought to exalt him. I'm in the same, uh, same place. Uh, 314, 274 of the, 278 of the original. <laughs> the Pharisees sought to exalt themselves by their rigorous observance of forms while their hearts were filled with envy and strife. Filled. They were filled with envy and strife. So they needed to be emptied. She then quotes, of course. She quotes Isaiah 58. She quotes the great chapter on the resurrection, the restoration, the resuscitation of the Sabbath as God intended, right? She quotes this. You fast for strife, and I'm reading now directly, page 314. You fast for strife and debate and to strike with the fist of wickedness. You will not fast as you are doing today to make your voice heard on high. Is this the fast I have chosen? A day for man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head like a bulrush and to spread out sackcloth and ashes? Do you call this a fast, an acceptable day to the Lord? And you know what I wrote here in my margin? There is no virtue in an empty stomach. This was the major failure of the religious leaders of the day. They thought the forms, the ceremonies, the rites and rituals were the thing, just like they thought scripture was the thing. All of those forms, all of those rites and rituals and ceremonies pointed to something deeper. There is no virtue in an empty stomach. Let me say this. There's no virtue in not working on Saturday. There's no virtue in that. You cannot work on Saturday and still be absolutely not keeping the Sabbath. Right? That's just the form. The question is not, what is your body doing? What are the motions that your body is or isn't doing? I'm not eating. I'm not working. Okay, fine and good. Why? Why? Because the form is not the thing. The ceremony is not the thing. These things point to the thing. And Isaiah's critique of fasting, because this all lines up with the chapter, is this isn't the fast I asked for. Then she goes on to say, the true fast is no formal service. What's the root word of formal? Form. Form. The true fast is no mere formal service. The scripture describes the fast that God has chosen. And then she quotes Isaiah 58, 6 and 10. To loose the bonds of wickedness. By the way, all of this is the ministry of Jesus. Listen to this and think of Jesus in the synagogue in Luke chapter 4 when he's quoting Isaiah 49 and 61. This is the ministry of Jesus to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo heavy burdens. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. To let the oppressed go free. If the Son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. And to break every yoke, take my yoke upon me, upon you and learn from me. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And to extend your soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul. She says, she's exactly right. Here is set forth the very spirit and character of the work of Christ, his whole life was a sacrifice of himself for the saving of the world. This is incredible. Whether fasting in the wilderness of temptation or eating, feasting with the tax collectors at Matthew's feast, he was giving his life for the redemption of the lost. <sighs> Friends, I, I, I'm not, I would not be surprised if a fiery chariot showed up right here in D. Casper's room and just took me to heaven. I'm like, I'm in glory right now. I'm just in a place where Jesus is so beautiful to me right now, so amazing right now. What? When he's fasting for me, when he's fasting in the desert, he's got me and you on his mind. When he's feasting at the table, he's got me and you on my mind. Everything Jesus did was to glorify God and to save all of the people that could be saved, the savory and the unsavory, the in and the out, the Jew and the Gentile. And God is glorious. He was giving his life for the redemption of the lost. I'm on 315, 278 of the original. Not in idle mourning, in mere bodily humiliation and multitudinous sacrifices is the true spirit of devotion manifested. It is shown in the surrender of self in willing service to God and man. And that's Jesus. Jesus kept covenant with God. He loved God supremely and he loved his fellow man genuinely. Ah, oh, he is... What do I say? What do I say? 
Um, she then goes to talk about, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, I haven't even gotten to some of the, okay, I've got to speed up here. Then she goes into the, nor could the principles of Christ's teaching be united with the forms of Phariseeism. This is the mingling of the old wineskins with the new wine, and you have to put new wine into new wineskins. Wine skins. She says they were fixed in a rut of ceremonies and traditions. Wow, that's a line. Fixed in a rut of ceremonies and traditions. Their hearts had become contracted. Whoa! Their hearts had become contracted, shrunk. That's what, that's what that word means, contracted, shrunk. Their hearts had shrunk all of their forms, all of their ceremonies, all of their pious religiosity that had separated and segregated them from the surrounding people had shrunk their hearts. Wow! They were in a rut of ceremonies and traditions. They mistook the form for the thing to which the form pointed. They mistook the shadow for the substance, and their hearts shrunk. She then says that they remain satisfied with a legal religion. She uses that phrase twice, legal religion. It was impossible for them to become depositories. Listen to that word, depositories. What is a depository? Something into which you deposit something, you place something, you fill something, full, empty, full, again and again. She just, she just keeps coming back to it. In fact, every time, I just marked it with yellow, and I don't know if you can see, but there's just yellow upon yellow upon yellow. Every time there was a reference, those 70 plus references, to fill, empty, depository, full, 70 times. They could not become depositories of the living truth of heaven. Why not? They thought their own righteousness was all sufficient. They did not desire a new element to be brought into their religion. They were full, so they don't need anything more. They don't need anything new. They don't need anything revolutionary. But like Paul in Philippians 3, we quoted, right? But what things were gained to me, those I count but lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. And I count them as rubbish, dung. That I'm, I'm empty, Paul says, of all the things that I thought were the things that recommended me to God. And now I'm filled with the things that actually recommend me to God. His spirit, his love, and, and this is my second big gem, his righteousness. His righteousness. I'll get there in just a second. A couple more things to say. Now I'm on page 316. Um, she just does it again and again. Here's another one. He found his new bottles for the new wine. Speaking of the tax collectors, the outcasts, the wrong people. He found his new bottles for new wine. She, I'm quoting again, if through the grace of Christ, his people will become new bottles, he will fill them with new wine. That's really the punchline of the whole chapter right there. It's just right there. There's two big yellow marks. And then this one down here. I, I just read these two. But this one down here, let me read it. Until emptied of the old traditions, customs, and practices, they had no place in mind or heart for the teaching of Christ by which they could have been filled. And there it is right there. Bam. Those three really, there's lots of little yellows all throughout, but these are the yellows that really, those are the Rosetta Stones. That's the key that unlocks the whole chapter. That's the key that unlocks the whole chapter. He found his new bottles for the new wine, number one. Number two, if through the grace of Christ his people will become new bottles, he will fill them with new wine, number two. And number three, until emptied of the old traditions, customs, and practices, they had no place. They had no place. They had no room because they were full. They had no room, no place in mind or heart for the teaching of Christ. I mean, friends, wow. Okay, okay. Ah, I'm just skipping stuff and it's hurting me. Oh, this is the last page. Oh, last page. Look at that. And then I'll give you the one more thing that's the big thing, because I told you there's two big things. The empty, full, empty. What, I did that wrong. The full, empty, full motif is like the big motif. There's one other gigantic one. Oh man, this is gonna be like two hours. This is incredible. Um, so I'm just reading literally the last paragraph. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a broken and a contrite heart. Oh God, these you will not despise. Do you know what that is? That's the Psalm version, Psalm 51, 17 of, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. I desire mercy. Yahweh desires mercy, not sacrifice. By the way, if you go back and you read Micah chapter six, verse eight, if you go back and read Micah chapter six, verse eight, which we know he has shown you, O oh man, what is good and what the Lord requires of you to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. 
What makes Micah 6, 8 so incredible is Micah 6, 6, and 7. What makes Micah 6, 8 incredible is the two verses that come before it. Let me read them to you. Micah asks a question. I've preached on this. I love this passage. With what shall I come before Yahweh? I'm reading Micah chapter 6, verse 6. Write it down. This is an easy one to remember because it's Hosea 6, 6 and Micah 6, 6 to 8. Those are the two passages that inform the I desire mercy, not sacrifice thing. And Jesus says it several times. Okay, this was a, a refrain for Jesus. This was a chorus for Jesus. This was a go-to passage for Jesus. Here we go. Micah says, with what shall I come before Yahweh and bow myself down before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings? Maybe with calves a year old? Will Yahweh be pleased with, oh, I know, thousands of rams or, or 10,000 rivers of oil? If you just keep following this logic, if God is to be assuaged, if God is to be purchased, if God is to be placated by something that I do, by some sacrifice that I bring, by some offering that I procure, well then, there's a certain logic to this. I'll just take that to the highest possible level. And that's exactly where Micah goes. He goes from burnt offerings to calves a year old to thousands of rams to rivers of oil. And then in that certain line of logic, he says, I got it. Should I give my firstborn child for my transgression? Should I give the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Because there's a certain logic to this kind of placating, assuaging, purchasing sacrifice. If God is pleased with a small sacrifice, if he's moderately pleased with a small sacrifice, then he's more pleased with a larger sacrifice. And he's more pleased with a still larger sacrifice. And what if I gave God the ultimate sacrifice? God would be so happy. God would look upon me with favor. Except I got news for you, friends. The message of the gospel is not at all that God requires of us the supreme sacrifice. The message of the gospel is that God provides the supreme sacrifice, the sacrifice of himself. And it's right there that Micah says, what are you, are you kidding? This is idolatry. This is paganism. This is heathenism. He has shown you, O oh man, what the Lord requires. He has shown you, O oh man, what is good and what Yahweh requires of you to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Yahweh does not require supreme sacrifice. He provides it. And that, my friends, I'm going to just read this here and then we're going to wrap it up. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. I'm reading the last paragraph. A broken and a contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. Man must be, here it is. Look at, how, look at how yellow this is. Look at how yellow this is. Man must be emptied of self before he can be in the fullest sense, fullest, fullest sense, a believer in Jesus. When self is renounced, emptied, the Lord can make man a new creature. Phil, again, you will be amazed how many times you will find this motif. Full, empty, full. Full, empty, full. And right at the outset, she quotes Philippians 3. The woman was filled with the Spirit. There's no way around it. By the way, I got to tell you this. I got to tell you this. My good friend, John Holland, I'll, I'll mention this again tomorrow because some people aren't going to watch two hours of this video. My good friend, John Holland, sent me a video from Dallas Jenkins' Instagram account. Dallas Jenkins is the maker of The Chosen. Okay, he sent a video from his Instagram account to me in which Dallas Jenkins, he's using his phone and he's going across a bunch of books that he was reading as he was preparing the Chosen series. And he puts his book, he, he, the phone, book number one, book number two, and I think there's like five books. And the third book he puts it on is The Desire of Ages. And he puts, the, he puts it on there and he says, unique vision. I kid you not. And I had been saying, after I saw The Chosen, I was like, this guy read The Desire of Ages. This guy definitely read The Desire of Ages. And sure enough, on his own account, he's going across all these books and he puts it on The Desire of Ages and says, unique vision. I knew it. I could smell it from a mile away. I'll mention this again tomorrow so the others can hear it. Woo! When self is renowned, I mean, like I was saying, the woman was filled with the Spirit absolutely filled with the Spirit. The proof is in the pudding. <sighs> when self is renounced, emptied, the Lord can make man a new creature, filled, 
new bottles can contain the new wine. The love of Christ will animate the believer with new life, just like all those tax collectors that began to see on the horizon of their life new possibilities with a new, better kind of religious leader. You better believe it. In him who looks to the author and finisher of our faith, the character of Christ will be manifest. Okay, this is going to be like two hours because I got to do the rubric and the prayer. And here's the second big gem. We just put our shovel in. You ready for this? Two hours deep. I can't believe it. We just put our shovel in and oh, we just hit a big gem. And I'm, I'm, you're just going to have to trust me on this. I'll show it to you. You don't believe me? Go through and see it for yourself. Like a layer, you know, those old transparencies where you could lay down like the anatomical transparency where you'd lay down like the skeleton, and then you'd lay over the internal organs, you'd lay over the circulatory system, then you'd lay over the muscles, and finally you'd lay over the skin. I don't know if you remember these. If you're old enough, you might remember these in the old encyclopedias. These transparencies, this layer on layer, and it just built every time. So, so Ellen White has the layer of the actual stories in Luke 5 and Mark 2 and Matthew 9. So there's that layer. And then she goes into the parable. There's that layer. And then the empty, the full, empty, full motif. She's laid that over. And I tell you, something popped out at me. And I was like, wait a minute. Did, did, did she say that? I, did I get that? And you've got to see this. Crucial. Page 315 of Types and Symbols, 278 of the original. Get ready for this, my friends. Get ready for this. 315 of the types and symbols, 278 of the original. Listen to this. This is what she says. Remember, this is the point about how they couldn't be depositories for the truth. Okay, I'll just read it here. While they remained satisfied with, this is all leading up. While they remained satisfied with a legal religion, the religious leaders, the Pharisees, the scribes, the elders, it was impossible for them to become the depositories, right, to be infilled, to be empty and infilled of the living truth of heaven, they thought their own righteousness all sufficient. This is Laodicea. They did not desire that a new element should be brought into their religion. Now, this line here, I was like, did I see what I think I saw? Oh, friends, I saw it, I think, on the second or third pass. And then after I went back through several more times, it's all over. You ready for this? Next sentence. The good will of God to men. Just a quick pause. That's the gospel, right? That's what the angels said. Peace on earth and good will toward men. It's the gospel. It's the glad tidings. It's the good news. So the good will of God to men, they, the religious leaders, the Pharisees, the scribes, and the elders, did not accept as something, and this is the key word, as something apart from themselves. What? What? They didn't accept the good news as something apart from themselves, external to themselves, outside of themselves. Watch where this goes. Next sentence. They connected it with their own merit because of their good works. And I saw those words. I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. I see where, I see what she's doing here. These words, legal religion, their own righteousness, apart from themselves, connected, merit, good works. Friends, 25 times, at least 25 times in this chapter. I'll just show them to you. Not all of them, but I'll give you a feel for it. 25 times in this chapter, Ellen White very specifically, very purposefully, and very unmistakably uses the historical, biblical language that was in the great, controver uh, the, the great conflict, the great debate of righteousness by faith in the context of the Protestant Reformation. She does it again and again and again, and what I did is I made a little symbol, and the symbol was the plus symbol because I ran out of my other symbols. So just the plus symbol, and I wrote RBF, 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 and I went back through, it's all over. It is absolutely all over. So I'll just show you here. Here's an RBF right here. When she quotes Philippians 3.8, look at this. Is there any on this page? Right here, RBF, right here. Um, any on the next page? Yes, right here, RBF. 
unmistakable. I mean, the language, righteous, she talks about um, uh, the right, uh, I, 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 I've got to hesitate here. Next page, look at this, RBF, RBF, back to back. How about this page? Right here, RBF, RBF, righteousness by faith, righteousness by faith, righteousness by faith, righteousness by faith. And all, I mean, just, I, I, I could literally keep going. RBF, right there, RBF, right there. How about on this page? Oh man, are you kidding? Look at this, this is like an RBF jungle here. RBF, RBF, it's hard to see here. RBF, there's the plus symbol, RBF, RBF. And I'll just read you one. I'll just read you one. You go back and you look for all of those key words. If you're at all familiar with the history of the Protestant Reformation and the great debate in the Protestant Reformation under Luther and others like Luther in the vein of Luther and then building on Luther, the language that they used, the points that they made, the arguments that they uh, constructed from Scripture, she uses the very same language. She, oh, I, I couldn't believe it. I'll give you just one example here. She says, <laughs> this, was the one, this was one of the ones that initially tipped me off because when, when we talk about, here's the point, why the whole thing about, they couldn't conceive of righteousness as something apart from themselves. They thought it was connected, that God's, friends, the great truth of righteousness by faith is that it's not that you're, be, you're the good person that finally got your act together and God accepted you on the basis of what you've done. no. The great truth of righteousness by faith is Desire of Ages, page 25. Christ was treated as we deserve, that we might be treated as he deserves. He was condemned for our sins in which he had no share, that we might be justified by his righteousness in which we had no share. He suffered the death which was ours, that we might receive the life with it, which is his. With his stripes, we are healed. With his stripes, we are healed. Remember, the sin that condemned Jesus was just as much his as the righteousness that saves you is yours. The righteousness that saves you is an external righteousness. It's Christ's righteousness. It's not your internal righteousness. Your internal righteousness is filthy rags. The righteousness that saves you is apart from you. It is separate from you. It, oh, oh, listen to this. Listen to this. The right, I'm quoting now from page 317, 280. This is just glory upon glory. The righteousness of Christ is to them the Pharisees, the religious leaders of his day. Listen to this. The righteousness of Christ is to them a robe unworn, a fountain untouched. A robe unworn, a fountain untouched. The righteousness of Christ is there. The garment is there, but they're happy with their own garment. Friends, the great truth and the thing that, that made me think, oh, is she saying what I think she's saying? They couldn't understand that righteousness was apart from them. It wasn't connected to them. It was given to them as a gift. It was crafted, created, and manufactured by Jesus. Jesus alone, Jesus' faithful life, Jesus' sacrificial death, Jesus' glorious resurrection and ascension, all of that's external to us, and God gives it as a gift, and we receive it. This is the Laodicean message. Go buy from me. Buy from me the gold and the raiment and the eye salve. Well, how do we buy these things? You buy them by faith because they cannot be purchased. You accept them. You receive them. They're a gift that's external to you and placed over you because the righteousness that saves you belongs to you just like the sin that condemned Jesus belonged to him. It was external to him. It was placed upon him. The righteousness that saves you is external to you. It's placed upon you. Now, somebody's going to say, yeah, but I'm becoming a better person. I'm becoming more loving, more kind, more gracious, more generous. Amen. And none of that is the ground of your standing with God. Yes, you're becoming a better person because of the gospel. But your becoming a better person is not the gospel. It's the result of the gospel. The gospel is the righteousness of Christ given to you. And if you don't take it and put it on, the righteousness of Christ to you is a robe unworn and a fountain untouched. Woo! What? What? They trust in self and depend on their own wisdom and do not realize their spiritual poverty. They think they are full when they are empty. They insist on being saved in some way by which they must perform some important work. Hey, 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 I want to do so. I want to play a role in my salvation. I want to, no, I'm sorry. That was achieved, you know, by Jesus, the son of God, the faithful one, historically. You can't go add to it. It's an, it's an act of history. It's an artifact of history. It's done. 
Salvation cannot be added to. It can only be received. It's an event of history external to you and inaccessible to you except by faith. Uh, listen to it again. They insist on being saved in some way by which they may perform some important work when they see there is no way of weaving their self into the work, they reject the salvation provided. A robe unworn, a fountain untouched. I mean, come on. Come on, beloved. Go back. Go back and read this chapter through two or three more times and, and with, do it with an eye for two things. Number one, all of those words with empty, filled, feasting, fasting, depository, open, closed, all of those words, the full, empty, full motif. That's number one. Number two, go find all of the references to righteousness by faith, righteousness by faith, righteousness by faith, righteousness by faith. It's all there and it is glorious. Friends, this, this had to be two hours. I mean, I knew I spent 20 minutes at the beginning telling you stories, but wow. You cannot come out of this chapter without complete confidence that God is in the business of saving people like you. People just like you. Oh, an outcast? Yes, you. Oh, a tax collector? Yes, you. Oh, a vile sinner? Yes, you. Jesus is in the business of saving sinners and not just of saving and then staying aloof from them, of going to their feasts and going to their parties and spending time with them and mingling with them, fraternizing with them, hanging out with them, and then saying, hey, follow me. Follow me. Let's, let's go. Let's follow me. Because you and I, Jesus says, Jesus says, you and I, we're going to make a great team. We're going to make a great team. You and I, I, I think you're just the kind of guy I'm looking for. I think you're just the kind of girl I'm looking for. You and I, we'll make a great team. How about we do this for, say, Eternity? Oh, let's do our rubric. Let's do our rubric. This has been a feast, my friends. This has not been... I look like a mad scientist. My hair's like... Ah! <laughs> I mean, oh, this has been a feast. We're not fasting on DA with DA day 29. We're not fasting. <laughs> There's not going to be a fast. Yeah, sure, we had to get to Pennsylvania. There's no fasting here. We're feasting. I was eating raspberries and cacao-covered almonds earlier and oranges and drinking a maca powder drink, man. That doesn't even compare to the feast we're having right now. Here we go. Here's the rubric. What's the point of this chapter? To tell the story of righteousness by faith through the lens of the call of Levi Matthew and the parables that followed. To tell the great gospel truth, the great Protestant truth, of righteousness by faith through the lens of the call of Levi Matthew, one of the outcasts, one of the despised, one of them, through the lens of that call and the parables that followed. Number two, what do we learn about the person of God in this chapter? Well, so much that we just want to worship him, right, for eternity. But how about this? That God is the kind of person to attend a party with just ordinary people, including some less than savory types. You know, people like you. <laughs> that's what we learn about God. He's the kind of person that's like, oh yeah, you're going to have a party and there's going to be a bunch of hated people there, the people that nobody else wants to hang out with. I'd love to come. Those are my people. Remember that line there? She says, the Savior was among his people. And in context, that, just mean, that doesn't just mean the Jewish nation. She means the outcast, the vile, the tax collectors, the sinners, the Samaritans, Jesus was among his people. You are one of God's people. He loves you with everything and gave everything for you. Friends, you are going to make it. With Jesus' help and Jesus' robe of righteousness, you are going to make it. Don't let his robe of righteousness be a robe unworn. Don't let his fountain of everlasting life be a fountain untouched. Okay, the prayer. You ready? This is an easy prayer. I mean, it's a hard prayer to pray, but it's easy to remember. Here it is. It's so simple. God, empty me and then fill me. God, empty me and then fill me. Lord, make me a new wine skin and fill me with new wine. Empty me so you can fill me. I want to be filled with all the good stuff. 
I want the fruit of the Spirit. I want that kindness, that affability, approachability, all of the things that Jesus was. Now, never, even if I became a really, really great person, by the grace of God, and people were like, whoa, Jesus is really reflected in David Asherick. I hope that's true. But that would never become the basis of my standing before God. That's just the reflection, the manifestation of the fact that I have put on, I have worn the robe of Christ's incredible, incomparable, unpurchasable righteousness. (sighs) And the practice. How do we practice this? God help me to see, to see everyone as a candidate for Christ's kingdom. Everyone, including the outcasts, including the icky, including those people. I want to be the kind of person, like Jesus was, to affiliate myself with everybody because, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we no longer judge any man according to the flesh. Nope. We believe, just a few verses later, that anyone can be a new creature in Christ Jesus. If any man is in Christ, he is a new creature, new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, everything's become new. And I want to be a man of principle, not a man of politics or of policy or of social media perspectives. I want to be a man of principle. Don't you want to be a woman of principle? Don't you want to be somebody that says, I'm not going to be actuated by politics or policy or the preferences or proclivities of others. I want to be actuated by the principles of the gospel, the great principle. I want to see every human being as possessing essential human dignity and being absolutely candidates for the kingdom. A thief nailed to the cross? Why not? A Samaritan woman? Why not? A bleeding woman? Why not? A tax collector? Why not? Well, beloved, we've gone over two hours. This has been an absolute spiritual feast. This chapter, a masterpiece. A masterpiece. And I want to say it again. Go back and reread it. Mark down all the references. I found more than 70. 72 references to the empty fill, all of that motif that we discussed. And I found over 25 direct, unambiguous references to the language of the biblical and historical truth of righteousness by faith. It's a masterpiece. This chapter is incredible. Now, I, what I don't know, I don't know if Ellen White was even aware of the depth at which she was writing. I have a suspicion she was. I have a suspicion that she knew exactly what she was doing. But it's also possible, as with the prophets in the Old Testament and the gospel writers in the New Testament, that they were writing at one level, a deep and wonderful and profound level, but the Holy Spirit was doing this whole other thing underneath that people only later, generations only later, would discover. Theologians would try to plumb the depths. As I said, put the plow down. We're putting the plow down a foot or two, but the earth is good all the way down. There's gems all the way down. So... My personal belief is that in a chapter like this, Ellen White crafted and knew exactly what she was saying. But even if she didn't, the Holy Spirit knew what he was doing. And no one could read this. And I'll read you my journal entry tomorrow. No one could read this chapter and have any other conviction than that Ellen White was absolutely familiar with and steeped to the bone in the great biblical historical truth of righteousness by faith justification by grace alone, through faith alone, to the glory of God alone. Just, if anybody ever questions you on Ellen White's understanding of the gospel, let them read this chapter. Just, just let them read this chapter and let them see, because it's, the woman understood the gospel. She understood it biblically and she understood it historically. And this is a masterclass by some incredible, wonderful, mysterious combination of Ellen White's own experience, her own inveterate discipleship as a follower of Jesus, and of course, and most importantly by far, the infilling of the Holy Spirit. I'm, I'm worshiping. I'm worshiping. And I'm so glad we're doing DA with DA. I mean, even if I'd read The Desire of Ages through on my own, I wouldn't be having probably this kind of experience that I'm having right now. And I hope you're having a great one too. Listen, let's close with prayer. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, what an experience this has been. We have not been fasting tonight. Lord, I thought I might need some water. I'm a little dehydrated and I didn't drink enough water, but Lord, two hours straight and I feel great. I feel like I could go two more hours. Father, you are incredible. 
Jesus is incredible. We believe, we receive, we accept. Father, help us to not let the righteousness of Christ be a robe unworn and a fountain untouched. Father, we want that great, beautiful, incomparable, unrepeatable event of history, the life, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus. Father, we want that righteousness to be applied to us, to be put to us, to be laid over us, because, Father, we are, should the truth be told, we are outcasts. In ourselves, we are vile. In ourselves, we have done things that, in our estimation, would cause a holy God to draw back from us. But, Father, we are astonished. We are amazed that Jesus didn't come to draw back from people like us. He came to spend time with people like us. Just as Matthew heard those words and was astonished when Jesus would say to somebody like him, because he thought Jesus would take no notice, follow me. He couldn't believe it. And when Jesus was at the feast with all of Matthew's outcast friends, all the wrong people, many of them did not become believers. But when the seeds that were sown that night at that feast were watered in the wake of the resurrection, the ascension, and the outpouring of the Spirit. Many of those people became followers. Father, plant those seeds in our heart. May we become committed followers. Father, people who say external means nothing to me. Policy and politics means nothing to me. I'm a woman of principle. I'm a man of principle. Father, teach us how to treat everyone with essential human dignity and to believe the best about everybody. Father, we are filled with self natively and naturally. So please empty us and turn us into new wineskins that you might fill us with that new wine, the glory of Jesus, the righteousness of Jesus, the beauty of Jesus, the teachings of Jesus. Father, that's what we long for. We long for that. Father, we have feasted here tonight, and my prayer is for those all around the world who have turned away from God, away from you, away from Jesus. But Father, they've not turned away from who you actually are. They've turned away from a caricature of who you are, a false and misrepresentation of who you are. Father, help us as your ambassadors, as your emissaries, as your disciples, to be the kinds of people that are directing and redirecting others to you because you are worthy, you are awesome, You are beautiful. And Father, we are so thankful for the plan of salvation. Jesus coming to save people like us. People like us. And Father, right now, by faith and faith alone, we receive that. We receive that. For us, Father, by grace, the robe of Christ's righteousness is not a robe unworn or a fountain untouched. We receive it. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. All right. God bless you all. Have a great night. We'll see you tomorrow. (laughs) Uh, It won't be two hours tomorrow. I I don't know if there'll be any others that are this long, but I got nothing else to do except talk to my people and I was on fire. So this chapter, man, this chapter. Tomorrow, the chapter is the Sabbath and we'll be with Dee. It'll be sometime in the afternoon. If you can catch the live, it'll probably be one-ish, two-ish. Eastern Standard Time. If you can't catch the live, it'll be on YouTube and archived on Instagram. God bless you all. I love you. And much more importantly, God loves you.